Welcome to the Innovation Storytellers Podcast. We talk to innovators and disruptors in R&D, product managers, entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs, innovation thought leaders, and their storytellers who help bring their amazing ideas to life. Now, here's your host, innovation storyteller, CEO, speaker, and coach to the world's top innovation teams, Susan Lindner. Welcome to Innovation Storytellers. For the last 20 years, I've been helping innovators and disruptors to tell their stories. 10 acquisitions, hundreds of innovative products, and countless hockey stick growth curves, as well as new categories later, I want to share how great innovations get to market using stories to pave the way. I've invited some of the top innovators and disruptors in the world to join me on the podcast to share both the story of how their innovation came to light, as well as the stories that got them there, providing some tips and tricks and maybe even some screw-ups in the middle. Um, to instruct us on how to craft better stories that get our innovations the resources, runway, and recognition that they deserve. I'm so excited today that Lisa Besserman is joining us today from Indeed. As many of you know, it is one of the biggest job hunting search, I would say job hunting search and find sites, right? We're not just searching for jobs, we're actually finding incredible jobs on Indeed. But she is the head of program at the Global Incubator at Indeed, combining entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. So as a little bit of a bio, Lisa, if you don't mind, I'm just going to um, share with our audience a little bit more about you. Lisa is the founder of Startup Buenos Aires Accelerator and has been named one of Business Insider's top 100 most influential women in tech and the business innovator of Latin America by the Council of Americas. She has also been credited as the women behind Argentina's startup revolution. Lisa was a Google mentor and has been a judge on dozens of startup competitions around the world. And she was recognized as a successful entrepreneur in Forbes magazine and an international spotlight entrepreneur from the U.S. Department of State. So not just a local, homegrown, fantastic entrepreneur and entrepreneur, but also takes her talents around the world. Currently, Lisa serves as the head of program of Indeed's global corporate incubator in Austin, Texas. Fusing her background of startups and corporates, she is recognized as a leader in the innovation space. So we are just thrilled to have you here on Innovation Storytellers. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so I want to get started a little bit. Your background is so fascinating. Buenos Aires. How did you get to South America? What called you there? Uh, well, this is for a shout out for my Game of Thrones fans. Uh, winter was <laughs> coming in New York. Uh, so I'm from New York originally, and, and winter was coming. Uh, at the time, I was working at a, at a tech startup. This was back in 2012. So this was before the culture of digital nomad, nomadism in, existed. And mm. um, winter was coming. My rent was up in my overpriced uh, New York City apartment. And so I asked to work remotely. And the plan was just to escape the New York winter uh, for two or three months while, while working remotely. Uh, my team was distributed. We were a, a typical tech startup. We had um, some team in, in Silicon Valley and San Francisco. I was in the New York office. We had some developers over in Europe. And uh, I just wanted to, to escape for a few months and have a, a working holiday, I guess you could call it. And so I looked at a map and I, uh, I needed to be in a similar time zone and I, I wanted to be somewhere warm. And so I just, uh, without much thought or consideration, chose Buenos Aires, Argentina. I didn't speak a word of Spanish, didn't know anybody in the city. Um, but at the time, I thought it would only be maybe two or three months max. So I, I packed a suitcase and a laptop and uh, down to South America, I went. And those three to four months turned into? Five years. <laughs> wow. Yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And so you go down and you're continuing to work with this tech startup. And then what happened? So I got down to Buenos Aires and something incredible happened. Um, I was meeting more entrepreneurs than I'd ever met in my entire life. Uh, you know, coming from New York, I was pretty active in the New York tech and startup scene. So I was you know, exposed to plenty of entrepreneurs. But when I went down to Buenos Aires um, and I, I started joining the local startup community, I was really surprised to see just the caliber and the resiliency of these entrepreneurs um, that I just continuously kept on meeting. Um, but I recognized very, very quickly um, that everyone lacked resources. It was a, a very resource-constrained um, city, um, country. 
there really wasn't much government support in terms of entrepreneurship and, and startups and innovation. Uh, there really wasn't much infrastructure. The elements of a strong and, and sustainable ecosystem existed, but it was just so fragmented and um, it was just, it just lacked so many resources. And so, you know, have, it's just seeing this and having this global perspective and having my network in the States, I started just connecting people very organically with things that they needed, whether it was, you know, a startup that was looking to raise funds. And I happened to know, a, you know, an angel investor in that specific vertical, or if it was a startup launching a new product and they wanted some press, uh, I happened to know a journalist, or if it was someone who was looking for a technical co-founder, I happened to know a developer. So just with my limited personal network, I was connecting, connecting the dots, synthesizing the data um, and connecting people. And then that's when I realized, hey, like this could exist on a much larger scale and have such greater impact if it was more formalized and if it was more centralized. And that's where the idea of Startup Buenos Aires was born. Originally, it was just meant to be a place where founders and, and startup enthusiasts could go to connect with one another, have events, um, you know, improve entrepreneurial knowledge based and educational systems, um, you know, networking. It was just meant to be a, a social network, I guess you could say, or a, you know, an in-person network and just a, a resource hub. Uh, and, and that was the plan. The plan was to keep my job and do this as, you know, part-time on the side. It was, there was, ah, the elusive that. side hustle. Sure. It's just a hobby. Know. What could happen? I mean, I didn't even call it a hustle <laughs> because there was no business model. It was just like, Hey, I just want to help people. And, uh, I'm really inspired by, um, by just the caliber of entrepreneurship here. And, um, that's where the idea was born. And then uh, essentially overnight, it, it, it just evolved to become this major hub. You know, more people were asking for things, more people wanted to be involved, um, you know, more people wanted to, to help. Uh, and so, you know, overnight it essentially just blew up to become this, uh, this startup hub. And I remember this, this moment where I was uh, chatting with a friend of mine, another expat in Buenos Aires, and it was time for me to go home. At this point, it was about three months in and I was getting ready to, to pack up and go back to New York City and go back to my job that I had a paycheck and stable income. Uh, and it was one of those like very pivotal um, moments where you're like, you, ha you see a fork in the road and you have to decide where to go. And uh, a friend of mine was just like, this is one of those things that if you don't do it, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And I knew he was right. I took the weekend and I you know, thought about it. And um, then that Monday I, I called my, my job and I said, hey, I'm not coming back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay and uh, I'm going to resign. And um, I gave my two weeks notice and then invested my life savings and uh, put it into building what became Startup Buenos Aires, which um, then became an early stage startup accelerator in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Wow. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the storytelling side of this, because in this portion of your life, which is so fascinating and so many different layers to what's coming next and where you are now. So at this stage in your life, the storytelling around what was a social network to now becoming a, um, and a networking point is now becoming a business. So I imagine that involves a fee. It's funny you say that. Um, you know, the, the reason why the organization was born um, was altruistic in nature. It was because the people that I wanted to help didn't have the resources to pay the fees to be in the networks that, you know, we, you know, that we see and that we become so, so accustomed to in, in, you know, first world countries where we have access to these things. And, um, you know, this is where I stumbled a lot along the way, you know, like, you know, the road to success is paved in tons of failure. Uh, and I failed horribly along the way. I mean, I, I'm what you would call an accidental entrepreneur. I never intended on being an entrepreneur. I knew nothing about entrepreneurship. I knew nothing about starting my own business. And I didn't even have a business model when I decided to quit my job and um, self-fund this, this initiative. Uh, and, and to be clear, that's a plan that you're endorsing for all future entrepreneurs. Is that right? <laughs> uh, I, I would definitely have a business, uh, business model in mind when you're starting off, but also just you know, the thing I, I say that to most people is fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Solutions can change. Ooh, wait, stop for that for a second. So fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. I mean, you know, when, when it comes to building products or services or, or next generation startups or, or innovations, it's, it's really, it's very simple. It's understand that you're solving a problem for people. And I think a lot of issues come up when when entrepreneurs and when founders are so married to their solution rather than the problem that they're trying to force this product market fit that doesn't necessarily work and, and prevents the, the potential to scale. 
because of it. And, um, you know, that's why we see the best and most innovative products and best and most innovative startups are startups that have pivoted because they recognize that it was a problem that they were solving, not a solution that they were pushing. Um, and so, you know, for me, the problem was apparent. The problem was there were no resources for entrepreneurs. There was no community for entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, there was nothing fueling this innovation ecosystem in, in this third world country that needed the support. And so, you know, in the beginning, I was a bit naive to think that we could survive off of corporate sponsorships, uh, because I saw that model work in the U S you know, we have a pretty great network. Uh, you know, we have the, the market that let's say the Googles and the Facebooks and the Chase banks or the BBVA banks are looking to target, you know, it's, it's tech enthusiasts, founders, startups. And so what I've seen in the past is these, you know, these large companies write large checks to have access to these large networks. And so I thought um, it would translate to, to South America and to what I was building. Um, but I was <laughs> sadly mistaken uh, that that does not translate. Um, and the, you know, the check sizes that they have and the access to the funds that they have in, in um, you know, places like Europe or places like the U.S. does not necessarily translate to the smaller subsidiaries in, in Latin America. You know, in the beginning, I, that, that was the business model. It's like, okay, we'll just get a bunch of grants, we'll get a bunch of checks, and we'll provide this value to these large companies while also being able, most importantly, to provide the value to the smaller companies and the startups that we're looking to support. After a few months, we recognized that that wasn't working. Um, it was really difficult and the just money just didn't exist. There was no way to get it. And so I remember, you know, sitting down with my team and just saying, hey, we're running out of runway here. And we're, it was self-funded with my small, you know, startup salary um, savings. And, you know, my team was, was split. We're like, we need to brainstorm. We need to figure out a way to, to create a sustainable business model that allows us to continue to do the work that we're doing. Because we did start to see the impact very early on in terms of what we were doing for the community. And the team was split. Most of the team was like, let's just start charging people. We're adding a value. We can start charging for events or we can start charging a membership fee. That was the easy solution, I guess, in some in some ways, but it went against every fiber of my being in terms of the mission and the vision for the organization. Mm -hmm. It was never mm -hmm. meant to be a place that we charge people to get the resources. It was just meant to be a place that helps people. Um, and I think creating a business model that does not serve your mission is you know, that's like a, an identity crisis very early on. And I just didn't want to put us in that position. I just want to stop you for a second. So yeah. what I heard you say was fall in love with the problem, not the solution you've created, right? Number one. And the other thing you said is that if the business model doesn't align with the mission and vision, it's bound to fail. Absolutely. Right. And so those are two really important things, you know, as you go forward and tell the story of this of what you were building of Startup Buenos Aires when you're looking at the community and saying, I need to be honest and authentic with the customer that I'm serving, right? Exactly. That I can't retrofit either the mission, the vision, or the solution, ultimately mm -hmm. the product, to serve some other need like cash flow, right? Or sustainability. I actually have to come up with a business model that serves all of these things, the problem, the mission, and the vision. I, I, I just think it's super powerful and it's, it's worthy of a pause to go, hmm, am I really doing that, listeners? Am I really doing that in my own business right now? Is my business model fitting my mission, my vision, and the problem that my customer is facing every day? Yeah, please continue, Lisa. Yeah, yeah so, so, you know, like, like I said, there, there was an identity crisis in the sense that I, you know, we wanted to mobilize a community. We wanted to, to build a community and we couldn't do that if, if we were charging them because, I mean, we knew they just didn't have access to pay that. Or we would just, we would just go against everything that we stood for, which was serving, serving the people first. I never started this company to make money. I never thought I would get rich. It was really just to solve a problem. Like I said, I fell, I truly fell in love with the problem and dedicated everything I had for many years of my life and many dollars of my savings into solving this problem. And so we were, we were at an impasse. I was run, we were running out of money. Um, you know, bills were, were due and um, we just didn't have a business model. And it got to the point where I was like, I, we might have to pack up. Like, this is just one of those things. Um, and, and that's a shame because I see the work that we're doing and I see the impact that it's having. And then we got very lucky. Like I, I believe in fate. I think something intervened. Um, we got an email from a startup in San Francisco. And they said, hey, we heard that Argentina has really great developers um, at a fraction of the cost of, you know, what it would cost to, to develop like a mobile app in, in the States. How much would it cost to, to build like an iOS application? And here's here are the specs, this is what I'm doing. Like, can you connect us with a, any dev shop? 
and, and I didn't even have that light bulb aha moment. I, it, it just didn't occur to me. I was like, oh, I, I happen to know a dev shop or like a, a firm that I've worked with that builds great mobile applications. Let me just connect them. So I connected them, didn't expect anything from it. And that sale wound up going through. They wound up creating a contract for almost $100,000. Uh, and and they, with that $100,000, they were able to get, I think, about three applications. So like a web app, wow. iOS, and Android. You couldn't even get one iOS app in, in California if you were working with, you know, a freelance mobile app developer, a senior level mobile app developer for that, for that amount. So they were able what to like, bargain. Yeah, yeah, they were able to 3x their investment and have this, you know, technology developed, senior level, high quality, outsourced um, or near shored. After that, I met- Or far shored. <laughs> That's how you look at it. Um, and then after that, I met with the, you know, the, the firm and they said, hey, can you do that again? Like that was, that was, that was great. You know, like we, we want to be an outsourcing partner. Uh, you know, we want to build our network and uh, our client base in the U.S. And then that's when I had the aha moment. I was like, wait, like I see the value that we're delivering on both ends. You know, there is an obvious demand for, you know, more affordable and cost-effective technology solutions. And there is a very clear supply in Argentina. You know, Argentina is home to some of the greatest tech talent in the world. Um, and they have, you know, high level English language skills, um, incredibly which smart and, and app developers, um, strong tech community. And so we had the supply, we had the demand, and I was the bridge in between um, based on my network in the U.S. And, um, just, you know, just based on the position that we created for ourselves as the, the knowledge base and, and, and center of gravity for startups and technology in, in Latin America and in, in Argentina. And then that's where, where the business model um, was born. It was like, wait, there's, a, there's an obvious value that we can create on both ends. We weren't going to charge the customer. We were just going to provide free consulting. If you, you know, you have an app, or you have like an augmented staff solution, you want to hire developers, come through us. We'll consult you. We have a database. We, we vetted, you know, a, a whole network of, of dev shops and, and freelancers and, uh, you know, technologists, and then we'll connect you. And then what we realized was that the business model existed in um, a consulting or a, a referral fee on the dev side. So um, what they did was just calculated our fee in, into their, um, you know, into their proposals, which was still significantly cheaper and most more cost effective than doing it in house or doing it in, you know, in the states. And we were able to keep our doors open. We were able to thrive, and we were also able to bring now at this point millions of dollars into Buenos Aires through technology outsourced solutions. Wow. Wow. And so you retain the name Startup Buenos Aires as that conduit for all of these large companies or medium-sized companies or even startups who are looking to develop in Buenos Aires, um, as opposed to creating Besserman Consulting, right? So tell us a little bit about that decision in how the story continued to play out with large clients back in the United States. Why was that important to you? So we were always community first. Uh, it was never, I never set out to start a company. I never intended to be an entrepreneur. I, I just wanted to mobilize a community and provide value to the people that I felt needed it. And so Startup Buenos Aires was the name that mobilized the community. It was a name that was, you know, recognizable and understandable without even knowing what we did. It was, it was a community. It was a, a startup ecosystem. And it encompassed so many things from, from resources and, and uh, you know, services to education to events. Um, and it was able to be because of that umbrella name, we were just instantly recognizable. And I think it opened a lot of doors and provide a sense of legitimacy from early on. Um, because, I mean, also like when you have startup and then the name city, there's generally a government um, you know, association with it in a sense. Or interest, um, at least. Interest or just some sort of legitimacy. So even if people didn't know who we are, they're like, oh, start up on the side. Yeah, I know you guys. But it's like, no, you don't. But um, no, you don't. <laughs> still, uh, yeah. So it was, you know, for us, it was, like I said, I, I never meant to start a consulting company. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never wanted to start a business. I just wanted to help the community um, and mobilize that community and, and was able to do so under the, you know, the title and, and the, the directive of Startup Buenos Aires. And did you wind up getting... A, government support, or B, that corporate sponsorship that you originally sought out? Yes, we wound up working very, very closely with the, with the Argentine government. Um, we had lots of partnerships with them, lots of initiatives. Um, I worked very, very closely um, with their team in terms of when uh, the government changed, when the administration changed, there was a, a president, Mauricio Macri, who was very entrepreneurial focused. 
He mm-hmm. put forth a lot of laws and a lot of policies and a lot of programs that supported entrepreneurship. So I worked directly with his team um, to ensure that we were building out these innovation programs correctly. Um, you know, there were you know, education innovation programs. There was a public incubator program that I worked with them. Um, and essentially what we did was we created, it was our goal and our mission was to create an innovation ecosystem in Buenos Aires focused on technology, startups, and entrepreneurship and do so in a way that opened up Argentina and Buenos Aires to the rest of the world. And so I worked very, very closely with the government to build that, um, which was essentially Startup Buenos Aires scaled um, with government support. You know, in terms of sponsorship, we, we never really went that route uh, because we, we were lucky we didn't have to, but we did create very close relationships with the Googles, with the Facebooks, with the Microsofts, um, because we positioned ourselves as the center of gravity for um, the tech ecosystem in, in Buenos Aires. And so they saw us as a conduit. So let's say they were hosting global pitch competitions or they were launching a new product and they wanted to get it in front of a, a certain um, group of people. You know, we were um, their local boots on the ground partners um, in order to enable that. Like, so it's, for example, when we work launched in, in Buenos Aires, they came to us and we worked with them for their launch party. You know, we worked with them to get the name, the word out um, to the city. We work very closely with them in terms of like creating a strategy for growth um, because we had you know, a vantage point and we had access to a community um, that they might not necessarily have had access to had they had not already been here. Not to mention for a company like WeWork, you were their target audience, right? I mean, all of those startups were hopefully, um, you know, looking to find space in a WeWork one day too. So fantastic. So tell us about the last chapter of that when you decided to leave. Sure. So um, at the time it was five years and I, I, you know, I made a promise to myself that I would not leave Buenos Aires until I knew that the organization could, could live and grow and sustain beyond my years at the helm. And I was very fortunate to grow a really great team. And I was also very fortunate that the government um, showed a very strong interest in uh, working with us and collaborating with us and partnering with us. I was, I was ready to go back to the States, you know, it'd been five years. Um, you know, I'm, I, I was missing a lot of milestones at home. You know, my family was getting older. I, uh, you, know, you know, when you live abroad, you, there's a lot of great things that come with it, but there's an opportunity cost. And um, mm-hmm. I was ready, I was ready to, to get back to, to the States and, and plant seeds and, and start the next chapter of my life. And um, so I reached out to the government and there was a time early on where they wanted to acquire us. Um, but the timing wasn't right. The administration wasn't right. And it just, it didn't work out. And so I went back to them and I said, hey, you know, I'm thinking of leaving. Like, would you be interested in, in acquiring the rights to start up on Um, So you can have the title and you can have the, the community and my team, you know, can be an Apple hire. Um, and they had interest, luckily. And um, I was able to 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 work out a, a deal with them. And um, they were able to to kind of take on the the future of, of Startup Buenos Aires. And, and I knew that it was time for me to, to move on to my next endeavor. And um, I also knew that the organization could continue the work that it was doing um, with a much larger impact and scale with the government behind it. And um, yeah, so I was really, really fortunate in that respect. Wow. So this is the first time ever in my 20 years of doing innovation storytelling that I have ever heard of a government acquiring a startup organization <laughs> and that it continues, right? I've certainly heard of lots of corporates acquiring startup organizations. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't <laughs> um, at like most mergers and acquisitions, right? Um, but how is Startup Buenos Aires doing today? Well, um, I think, you know, it's still around. Uh, it still has a presence. The government has changed again. That is the peril, right? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, I, I was really disappointed um, with the election results in Argentina. So unfortunately, the, the government, the, the current administration does not have the same um, perception of entrepreneurship and global capital markets and um, globalization and internationalization of, of startup ecosystems as the previous administration does. So I think it had its time and I'm hopeful that again, it will, I mean, it's still running, um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that at least on, on the city side, it can continue um, and on the local side, it can continue um, on the national side. It just doesn't have as much investment and support and um, focus on entrepreneurship and technology uh, that, that there was in the previous administration, unfortunately. Yeah. And the only good thing about politics is that it's a pendulum, right? So at some point we know it will swing the other direction. It's just a question of when. You know, the thing about, about entrepreneurship in Argentina is entrepreneurship is embedded in the DNA of Argentines. They are the most resilient entrepreneurs I've ever met in my entire life. 
And so regardless of where they are, macroeconomically speaking or politically speaking, there will always be um, a thirst for innovation and there will always be um, a next generation of, of entrepreneurs that will come and, and solve problems and build new solutions and use innovation to solve these problems. Um, because, you know, necessity breeds innovation. And I think, you know, Argentines are among the most creative and resilient type of, of founders that I've ever seen anywhere in the world. Yeah. And um, you really can't beat uh, the food, the dulce de leche, the uh, incredible, forget about the tango, but um, just the, um, the spirit on the street in Buenos Aires is, is, such a, is such a remarkable culture and aliveness there. And even knowing historically what um, Argentines have surmounted in their own past. So pretty incredible. Okay, so now you're on a completely different journey, right? You come back to America and tell us about the innovation that you are building at Indeed, already itself a disruptor in the job placement, job seeking space. If you know the statistics around Indeed, please share them with us. Like how many million people are on Indeed actively looking for jobs? Right now, I mean, we have hundreds, hundreds of millions of impressions a day. Billions of people use Indeed. The numbers are staggering. It's it's just incredible the amount of impact that this one site has had throughout the years, and and just how you know innovative innovation forward they are when it comes to solving problems, especially now with COVID. You know, when, when we're looking at the job economy, it's it's a huge challenge and a huge problem, and that's that's changed significantly just over the past few months. And um, you know, ha- being a part of a team that is tasked with solving those large issues that impact millions, if not hundreds of millions, of people is just um, you know, it's, it's an incredible um, responsibility. And uh, it's it certainly to mention the um, the billions of dollars of GDP, right? About just the American citizen. I forget about the worldwide citizen, right? So many people impacted by COVID right now, but the ability for the entire world economies to function on the backs of individual citizens' employment yeah. is massive. And so when you are now creating and developing this incubator at a global level for Indeed, tell us a little bit about that program, how it got started and your role in it. Sure. So. You know, it's, it's really interesting to be one on the other side of the table and have resources, which is Ooh, lovely. resources. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't come from a space, you know, I'm, I'm, I come from the startup space for the past, you know, 10, 15 years uh, and the founder space for the past seven years. So having access to resources is very new for me. Um, and so being on the other side of the table is, is a really valuable vantage point that I haven't had uh, previously. Um, and so the, the really interesting thing about Indeed is it's an internal product incubator. So we don't invest in external startups in the HR or tech space. We build them in-house, which I think is really interesting because it provides um, this culture of intrapreneurship is what we call it. And so essentially the way that the the incubator is structured is anybody at the company, we have over 10,000 employees, 60 plus cities around the world. Anybody at Indeed can pitch a new product idea. We have um, something called open pitches. So we'll provide um, support, we'll provide mentorship, we'll provide pitch workshops. Uh, we'll provide you know access to like lean startup methodologies and understanding metered funding model and the venture capital um, you know methodologies, and uh, so we'll enable anybody at Indeed to pitch a new product idea, and it'll go through um, a few pitch rounds, and if their product is as we say funded, they'll have the ability to um, run their idea as a, we call them a founder, and so we treat each new product idea as a, as its own startup. And so within Incubator, we provide the resources to enable that that growth. So the founder will come in and be essentially a CEO, and then we'll provide resources like legal, um, global product commercialization, sales, marketing, um, product development, engineering. And so we'll essentially create these little pods, which represent mini startups. Uh, and where where you know our our model is nail it then scale it. You know we we, we like to make big big bets, but we <laughs> so I just want to hashtag. Nail it, then scale it. This is and is this a good philosophy for you in general yeah. when it comes to entrepreneurship? Nail yeah. it, then scale it. Yeah, you know it's it's a it's actually a, a very popular book, um, which I recommend to to your listeners out there. Um, oh, great! Yeah, we love it. resources. Um, you know, for <laughs> us, it's about you know building an MVP. You know, building the minimum viable product, testing it out, making data driven decisions, 
and then deciding what, what you want to do with that, whether we decide to scale it. And that's also one of the great things about the structure of incubator is we operate on a metered funding model. So the life cycle or the, the time that you have to prove the product viability with data um, is very short. So, you know, the first round is How short. Uh, so the first round is three months. So that's our angel round. Uh, next round, you get six months of funding, that's seed round. And then we do a series A, which is a year, and then series B, which is um, anywhere from like 1.5 to two years. And so in that time frame, you need to um, prove through data that your product is scaling or that it's moving in the right direction. Um, and we work very closely with our executive um, management team. So like our CEO, our CTO, our COO, our VP of product, they're all heavily involved in the not only the investment process, but also the advising process. Um, so they serve as, as sponsors for these products and these, these mini startups, which enables our team to have a visibility and like access and, and understanding from an executive level as well when they're building these, these new products and new solutions and solving these problems. But, you know, in terms of nail it and scale it, we say, you know, the, the MVP needs to be that. It needs to be the minimum viable product. And we need to test that out over time and um, make these decisions based on data, not on emotion, you know, and, and ensure that we're doing what's right for the user. Our motto is, you know, um, help people get jobs. And we always put the job seeker first. We never charge the job seeker as well. That's one of our principles. And so really when we're building these products, whether it's employer facing or job seeker facing, it's always put the job seeker first, because that's why we exist. Mm. So, you know, in the innovation storytelling model that I've created, right, there are five essential rules of innovation storytelling. So the first off is, is to take a look at the history, right, that your hero of the story, right, your person who's going to be the job seeker, who is always the hero of the funding, right? I mean, there is the founder who comes in with the idea, but Ultimately, we're serving the job seeker, right, when it comes to Indeed. Where do you find that um, historically, like when you look at some of these pitch ideas, where you seek out to really meet the job seeker where they are in the process, right? I mean, you deal with a level of sophistication from, you know, restaurant worker all the way up to senior level coding executive, right, technical executive, how does a person who's bringing a new idea in the incubator kind of meet the job seeker where they are? Is that the founder, right? Your, your new entrepreneur, your newly minted intrapreneur, I guess. Um, how does he get close to understanding that job seeker's needs? Well, it's funny you say that because when I, when I first started at Indeed, you know, as I mentioned, anybody can pitch a, a product idea. And mm -hmm. so my assumption was the ideas that got funded most frequently would probably come from engineers or product managers because they understand the product and they understand the technology best. I was completely wrong. Um, most of the funded ideas come from customer service and sales. Because people who are hearing the problems every day. Exactly. They are the ones that are closest to the problems and they are the ones that are closest to the users. So they are, they have this really unique understanding and vantage point of the problems that, I mean, you know, we're far removed from the problems. You know, we think in solution based, uh, you know, methodologies where we're like, okay, let's build this. But it's like, what's the problem that you're solving? It's like, well, I don't know, but the solution's really cool. Um, and so a lot of the, like most, well, most of the successfully funded projects and products have come from the CS and sales side because they are so close to the problem. And that's where the whole, you know, like fall in love with the problem comes in time and time again. And this is something I said to entrepreneurs starting up in, in Argentina. This is something I've said to friends starting up in New York. And this is something I say to teammates building products in, in a corporate. Uh, and I think that that time and time again, when you're, when you're building something and when you're focused on innovation, it should always come back to the problem. Yes. So... You know, so step one is getting the shared history, right, of understanding where we all come from in this painful problem of trying to find a job, right? And I imagine there's an incredible level of empathy there with the person who's pitching this idea. Well, step number two is the profit, right? So how do you know that the person who is pitching this great idea, right, to you in the incubator is best suited to lead this initiative just because they had the idea? That's a great question. And that's something that we certainly take a lot of time and consideration when it comes to the evaluation process. It's not just, did this person come to us with a great idea that we believe in? It's, do we believe in this person as a founder to lead this product? Because, you know, ideas are cheap. 
Um, and it's really all about the execution of those ideas that can make or break the product um, or the innovation or the solution. Um, right. And so for us, it's not just, is this the good idea that we want to fund? Because it is expensive to fund a product. And a lot of the times we don't have a business model from day one. And, and sometimes we never have a business model. You know, we have a lot of social impact products that we're working on that we'll never charge users or, or customers for um, because it just doesn't fit our, our, our mission. You know, so for us to make the investment in, in testing out this theory, which is essentially what it is, is a thesis, we're, we're testing it out to see if it works. Uh, we really need to believe not only in the idea, but in the person executing that idea. Um, and, and one thing, one way that we're structured is, you know, we don't expect everybody to have product development experience. So, you know, one way that, that our, our team is structured that I think is really valuable is when we do have a founder come in that it doesn't have necessarily product management experience, we'll pair them with a PM uh, and then they'll work together as partners to drive not only the vision of the product, which came from the founder, but also the execution of the product development, which will come from the PM. So often I use the term profits, um, you know, thinking about um, each one of these individuals, incredible humans, right? Our prophets, uh, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, um, Moses, right? All of them who brought fantastic information to the rest of the world, right? Game-changing information. And yet, there was typically a band of 12 friends <laughs> right, who actually brought the vision to life, who helped to execute and spread the word around that. Um, step three is also about the message. You know, so once you've decided to invest in that idea, it's not simply enough to make the investment, cross your fingers and wish. You actually have to push out a message that says, we're doing something transformational here. We're shifting the way that something has taken place before. We're going from an eye for an eye to turn the other cheek, right? We're causing some kind of innovation is in essence, bringing about a shift that stops us from doing what we were doing before and forces us to do something in a whole new way. To the point where if we do it right, people never wanna go back to doing it the old way again. So tell us a little bit about how you create a message around this cool new thing that everyone else either internally or externally will want to embrace. Sure, I mean, you know, I, I, like I said a bit earlier, and I think this correlates is necessity breeds innovation. Um, you know, and that works, you know, when I was talking about Buenos Aires, but also let's, let's think about COVID right now. Um, you know, we had this idea a few years ago about doing video interviewing and like building a video interview platform. Uh, so it solves the problem of scheduling. It solves, it solves a lot of, a lot of problems. You know, we call it the black hole when one reaches out and you never hear back from either, either side. And so we had this idea a few years ago about building this video interview platform where we could not only source people, um, and provide job postings, but also have the interviews take place on our platform as well. Um, we found that the appetite for this was very, very low because it wasn't a problem. Uh, people didn't see it as a problem that they they wanted to rely on technology to solve. In fact, they they saw it as, if anything, um, a disadvantage because they wanted to be face to face. Whereas now we're we're in a totally new world. Um, and uh, you know, over the past month or so, video interviewing has gone up twelve hundred percent globally. From wow, it's incredible. And so the wow. appetite has changed. Obviously, um, you know, the risk tolerance profile has changed. And now it, it's become a necessity. It's not just like a feature, a nice feature to have. It's we, we need to hire and we have no way of doing so in a safe and responsible way in, in this time of COVID. So we need to rely on technology. We need to rely. And there are some certain things that, you know, these existing platforms like Hangouts and Zoom just can't do, like have a lobby, a waiting lobby, or go, um, you know, from, from user to user. Um, you know, there's just a, not a lot of capabilities that were integrated because it wasn't built to be an interviewing platform. It was meant to be a, you know, video chatting or meeting platform. You know, at the time, you know, it's like timing is everything. At the time, it was, you know, just idea, an idea on our backlog that it wasn't a problem we were solving now because it's such a wide problem globally. I mean, this is happening in, in every country. Anybody that needs to hire needs a way to do so um, and cannot do it okay. safely at, at this time without doing it virtually. And so, this was one of the projects that we fast tracked uh, and we put a very strong team behind a lot of resources. And in fact, it's now becoming um, a, a humongous platform for Indeed. We you know, now have this goal of having every interview on our platform um, in the future, uh, just like we wanted every job in the world on our platform, um, which 
done a great job at, at, at accomplishing. Um, and so you're now, almost there, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Unless it's, you know, Uncle Irwin wants to hire somebody down the block. Even now, right? Uncle Irwin gets on her, I guess on indeed. Um, yeah, so I mean, we're about uh, for us, it's about the messaging and, but also it's going to keep on coming back to, you know, when it comes to innovation, it's about solving problems. And now this problem was at the forefront of everyone's mind and we had a solution for them. We had a way to show our value and do so in a way that solved this major problem. And, and it was all about timing. Well, you know, some messages work and some messages flop. And given that this is an uh, instructional podcast that really seeks to help innovators figure out how to better tell their story, given the, uh, given the number of ideas that you've been incubating and, and the internal founders that go with them, can you share with us some, some things that didn't work so well and maybe some of the learnings that you got from maybe the message that didn't really resonate the first time around? Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because failure is a big part or how we view failure is a big part of how we succeed an incubator. So we don't see failures as that. We don't see failures as failures. We see them as learning opportunities. Um, and if we see failures as failures, then we fail as, as a company, we fail as an organization, um, and we fail as an initiative. So what we do is whenever a product does not succeed, um, or we realize that we need to shut it down, or we realize like it's, it's just too risky, um, or it just, there was no product market fit, or the, you know, the MVP just didn't make sense, um, we repackage that as learning, and we disseminate it to the entire organization. We host an event, um, we put together a deck, and then what we do is we take it one step further and target different teams within Indeed who can learn from certain um, experiences that we had, whether it's something we learned about the job seeker, something we learned about the market, something we learned about the opportunity size, something we learned about data. Uh, and then we'll, we'll share that information and repackage you know, this typical, like you would call it a failure, but it, it's now actually saving money. It's saving you know, um, redundant experiments. It's saving time. Uh, and it's right. helped people. And, and, you know, there are times where the pro we'll shut down a product, but certain components of the technology will live on in another team and help other people and have a much larger life cycle or longer life cycle than it, than it would have at Incubator. And, and one, one thing I can, I can share, one, I guess you can call it a failure, um, but it was, a, it was a great learning experience is uh, we decided to incubate something similar to care.com. So like having babysitters, caregivers on the website um, nannies, where, dog walkers, yeah, the nannies, whole bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but primarily babysitters and nannies and caregivers, um, because we're like, hey, we have all of these jobs. We have, you know, all of these job seekers. We we have, you know, the supply and the demand. Why not put them all in one place? And so we we essentially created this very similar to care.com uh, model, and we had high hopes for that because we saw like the market size was there, the opportunity was there, the product market fit was there, um, the the path to monetization was there. But we also came across major inherent flaws in the model in terms of risk. It was attracting bad characters. Uh, mm. it, there was too much liability. Um, and we just recognized that the inherent risks of the product could not be solved through technology or product development. There was nothing we can do to prevent bad things from happening with bad people um, in this specific vertical and in this specific area. And that's when we realized we learned something great. This is just not a space we want to be in. In our, in our, uh, you know, opinion, it was a very inexpensive lesson to learn because nobody got hurt. Um, you know, we didn't put anybody in danger, um, and there was no, you know, PR nightmare. Uh, but it was one of those things that we didn't realize until it started happening that this is just not a space that we want to um, to approach, and this is just too much of a liability, and and just the inherent risks are too high, and it's nothing that we can do to change that through technology or through innovation or through product development. And so we decided to shut down the project, but we learned a great deal in that process. And so that was a success to us because we now know there is a specific vertical that we will never touch um, because it's just too risky. Yeah, which is like, uh, you know, I think about job seekers in their 20s. I remember advice I got was, take every awful job you can so you know you never want to do them again. <laughs> Let that be your inspiration as you plow into your 30s to figure out exactly what you want your career path to be. Um, and four career paths later, you eventually figure it out. And, you know, and, and I, um, I, I brought this up in, um, in my first book, which was like, you know, what would you call Edison's number 7,642nd try at the light bulb? Yeah, it was a failure. What else was it? 
uh, because we step closer to the light bulb. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's what he would have said too. Mm-hmm. So step number four is, you know, once you get this message is finding some early adopters. Like who are those people who will take the message forward and move that message for you. And I'm just kind of curious with, uh, is there um, a programmatic way at Indeed's Global Incubator that you begin to get people on board and have them see the message and spread it so that more people are on board with the innovation? Yeah, yeah, we, um, you know, like I said, we take a very data-driven approach to how we decide to scale. Um, and so you can't do that without user testing. You can't do that without, you know, em- employer recognition. You can't do that uh, without understanding if you are actually solving a problem or if the solution that you're providing is substantial enough to solve that problem. Um, and so we do have a, um, a group, Global Product Commercialization, that talks frequently um, with employers that understands, that explains the pain points and understand, explains the solution. We have our UX team that frequently speaks with users, does user testing, uh, user interviews. And what we do is we take that data and we take that information and then we're able to iterate on that. Um, And then we do also have an internal directory of employers that are early adopters. They're willing to test out new products, um, you know, because it's free, um, because it gives them access to to, to certain opportunities that they wouldn't necessarily have. And and they in in turn give us their feedback and we're able to use that as as a communication loop to understand like, are we building the right thing? Does this make sense? Is this solving the actual problem? Do we need to iterate? Most of the times the answer is yes, we need to iterate um, on it. Uh, and, but I think, you know, it, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to build the right product or solution if we weren't talking to users on a regular basis. Like that's, that's you know, part of our mantra is just, we always need to be talking to users and understanding that we're solving the problem. So important. I mean, step one of those early adopters is actually getting them to use it. That's a big world of pain for a lot of companies, right? Just getting someone to try it, um, especially when the stakes are quite high for some of those betas, let's say, of new products and new ideas. But how do you actually get them to spread the word for you? You know, one of the reasons I use the analogy of a prophet is because um, I call them the greatest viral marketers of all time because thousands of years later, we're still telling their stories. And so I'm curious how you not only get them to use it, but you get them to spread the word of mouth about that product as well. Is there a mechanism? Do you work with your comms team? Do you think about the messaging right to those beta users from that moment in order for them to hit send somewhere else? Well, I mean, for us, we're in the experimental phase, so we like to keep things small intentionally um and quiet too yeah yeah i mean a lot of the things that we don't we don't have we don't do like external comms for a lot of the products because they are in beta um and if we shut them down we also don't want to disrupt a a wide array of people you know so like if you know if we're if we're doing user testing with 20 clients and we decide you know the product just doesn't work or it's just not going in the right direction we shut it down it doesn't disrupt a huge marketplace it doesn't change the you know integrity or the infrastructure of thousands of employers or millions of job seekers. So for us, we are intentionally small, the way that we're structured and the way that we're built until we get you know, past the, the beta stage. Um, and then once we get past the beta stage, it's really just about building a product that people want to evangelize. Um, and it's about building a product that speaks for itself. So for example, you know, one of our products that, that we have out in, 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 the, in the wild is text to apply. And so let's say you go to Chick-fil-A or um, you, know, you go to your local gas station or a Chili's um, and um, you don't necessarily have a, an Indeed profile or you don't have a, a traditional resume, but you do have a cell phone because most people do. And it doesn't even have to be a smartphone. You can go through the entire interview screening process uh, with, this, with this product. Uh, and so that's been really useful. And that's something that we just see companies evangelize. You know, a lot of times these are franchisees, like um, franchises. Uh, and so if one uses it and they find success, they'll tell, you know, another franchise uh, or they'll tell, you know, someone in from corporate or headquarters. And then that'll essentially be, you know, the the path to um, widespread adoption. But for us, we're we're very intentional about not getting too big too quickly um, because we just don't want to put ourselves in a position where when we do shut down or if we do shut down, it disrupts too many users. Gotcha. And so a product like that, um, that seems to have such incredible need 
right now in the market where people, you know, may not even have a computer, right? We're seeing this vast digital divide with school children in the United States, right? Some of whom their only internet connectivity is their mom's cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly without a computer or other means of connecting with school even. So when you think about job seekers in various states around the country, that text to job is really a lifeline economically. Um, and the fact that you're doing it um, where it's platform agnostic in a way in that um, people can find you even if they never opened an Indeed account because the employer has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the fantastic. rate is about 80%, which is unheard of. Like, I mean, it, it, that doesn't wow. translate to the website at all. Like our platform, it, it never gets that high. Um, so it just shows you that we were solving a, a real problem with a very simple solution. Uh, in terms of technology, we wanted to make it as simple as possible so it would be, you know, accessible to the masses. Gosh, I'd love to get that response rate for my kids via text. <laughs> that would be yeah. fantastic. 80% response rate. Yeah. <laughs> product managers on there. <laughs> yeah, I got to get a product manager on my kids' communication with me. Fantastic. Um, you know, and one of the other steps I left out of these uh, five steps of innovation storytelling is really getting on board with the values and that there's an alignment with the values between the listener of the story and you. Do you find over time that there's a shift in the values between indeed the new products you're putting out and that customer? Like, are you finding that values change? Like um, not just the expediency or the delivery mechanism of the innovation. I mean, I think values evolve, but to the core, we need to stay true to our mission. And that is our North Star. And I think and that what is that helping people get jobs. That's our motto. That's what we do. That's what we build. Everything else is inconsequential. Um, and I think, you know, like I said, values can evolve. Value, you know, models can pivot. Um, but your mission and who you are needs to remain the same. And it needs to always be at the forefront of your mind with whatever you're building, with whatever you're scaling, with whatever you're looking to accomplish. And this, this is for big companies. This is for small companies. This is just, you know, anybody that, that wants to innovate, you need to know what your mission is and you need to stay true to that mission. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that to the core is who we are as an organization. That I believe is why Startup One Aside has had the success and the adoption and, and the mobilization and the community mobilization that it had at the time, because we always stayed true to the mission and the vision and our values while they might have evolved as we evolved and scaled as we scaled, um, it, it always remained the same at the core. Lisa, if people want to get in touch with you, want to understand a little bit better about um, the incubator program, where would you direct them? Sure. So they can either reach out on Twitter. I'm at Lisa Basterman or um, happy to speak on LinkedIn as well. Uh, just find me at Lisa Basterman. Fantastic. And uh, where can we find out about the cool new products that are the result of the incubator's magic. Um, how do we know it's really coming from your team as opposed to indeed corporate? Uh, or does it, does it all work out to be the same? We don't, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the whole <laughs> point. That's how you, you know we were successful when it, when it becomes uh, acquired into the core uh, offering at Indeed. Um, but most of them don't, you know, most of them don't make it and that's okay. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a part of the learning process, but it's through those learnings that we're able to build the next generation of innovation products um, that you and, and, and millions, if not billions of people can use in the future. Well, absolutely fantastic. And we wish you buena suerte with everything that you're doing um, at Indeed and the innovations and the amazing stories you're bringing to light as a result. Thank you so much, Lisa Besserman, for joining us on Innovation Storytellers. This innovation story has ended, but yours is just beginning. Go to innovationstorytellers.com, download the free innovation storytelling blueprint, and sign up to pre-order Susan's book, Innovation Storytelling. Get the resources, runway, and recognition you deserve due out this spring. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Until the next innovation story.